Here with Eric Kibler, former Horizon High School head coach, 20 region championships, six state championships, all-time NAS coach in Arizona with 808 victories over 38 seasons. Uh, Eric, thanks for jumping on with me. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and we've gotten to connect uh, through the ABCA Youth Committee, but what does this award mean? I mean, it's double duty for you. You you got the Dave Kylitz Award, but then uh, you're also going into the ABCA Hall of Fame. Well, it's really humbling. I mean, I didn't expect any of that stuff. When you start coaching, you, you just want to coach and make a difference. And so uh, the ethics one's really special just because what it means and who it represents. And uh, a lot of people have have guided me the right direction. I was smart enough to try to follow most of it. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> hey, how did you get from Ohio to Arizona? Good question. Um, I, I taught five years at Van Wert High School in Ohio, and then I met my wife there. And so we wanted to move out of there. So we just had a van and a dog and decided just to take our jobs and take our chance to move to Arizona because we liked it. And air, and baseball was going to be a little bit better there. So she got a, she went to ASU for a master's degree, started her master's degree there. We just took some money out and had six months of uh, money and we, you know, we were just ready to go. So I haven't looked back since. It's nice, except it's hot out here more often now. It's about four months of summer, man. It's getting crazy. Did you head it's straight to Horizon High School then? No, actually, I taught at uh, Palo Verde Junior High for a year. And then I was an assistant varsity P, P um, and basketball coach, assistant basketball coach in Paradise Valley High School for two. Then they opened up the new school, Horizon. That's where I got there. So did you reach out to them or did they reach out to you about taking over the program and starting the program at Horizon? Well, that was a new school, so I got to start from the ground up. So it was pretty awesome. I mean, a lot of work, but it's kind of fun to start your own program and sink or swim. And, you know, I had a bunch of great kids to start with, so they helped me out a lot. I mean, for somebody that's having to do that right now, start. where would you start? Like, you got a blank slate, start a program. Where, where would you start with building a program? relationships and culture you gotta start with that i mean you gotta start with working with good people and have good leadership around you that's where you have to start because if you don't have that it's gonna be a tough road it's gonna be an uphill slide did you know coming out at undergrad that you were going to coach i did yeah i coached at the high school for the deaf during school at ohio state and so that was a great experience coaching those kids i mean they they taught me a lot a lot of patience but they were very intense, paid attention, and they were great kids. So I had a, that was really fun for me. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that. And, and you know, uh, sports made a big difference to me. My dad coached me in um, baseball, so that, he had a big influence on my life, too, just going into coach because it made such a difference in our community. I mean, because you're starting from scratch at Horizon, I mean, what resources did you lean on or who did you lean on to, to get things going? That's good. Well, we <laughs> – we just had a field with a softball fence. <laughs> that was it. So we had to fundraise as much as we could. So it took a while for the facility to get up to speed, but there wasn't much there. It was just kind of desert land and do what you can do on a yearly basis. But it was hard. I mean, kind of lean on family and lean on the coach that I was with and lean on people that I knew had done this before. And so uh, the first uh You'll laugh at this. The first speaker I ever heard in my life was Gordy Gillespie. I was out of my seat. I'm going, oh, my gosh, that's the first guy I ever heard. And he was awesome. That's, and then I heard John Scalinas later on. I'm going, man, talk about two guys just influenced. I mean, I was ready to go play right then. <laughs> was it intimidating, though? You look at those guys and you're like, I don't know if I can get to that level. Yeah, I didn't compare it. I just love their enthusiasm, their straightforwardness and their honesty and just what they just who they were. So I didn't really try to compare myself. I just thought I'm just going to, I just love what they did. And I thought, you know, I can take that with me, their enthusiasm and how they, how they thought about the game and how they thought about people and just how they did what about their business. So I was lucky to have those two guys right off the bat. What type of fundraising did you guys do then to try to get things going? <laughs> Every coach in the world would laugh at some of the stuff we did. We sold gym bags. We sold candles. We sold anything you could sell. <laughs> So, I mean, and we were limited in our fundraising. So the first five years was difficult. It really was. So we didn't have much, but we did what we could do. And then a uh, new principal came in and allowed me to do more, more stuff. It makes a huge difference on the who fundraising your administration is, is. Yeah. And you can talk to a lot of coaches. Fundraising is not fun. 
No, it's not. <laughs> but it's necessary. Yes, Got it's a necessary it. evil. Who's the best player to come out of Horizon High School? Oh, wow, that's a tough one. I think Brandon Wood is probably the best position player to come out. And then Jared Berkowitz, Ryan Mills, and Tim Allison were pitchers that came out of there. We're uh, not just good players, but good people. And, um, yeah, they really helped our program out. I mean, you have those guys on the mound, you're a lot better coach. <laughs> I mean, what is the separator? Mm -hmm. Your guys that got a chance to go on to pro ball in college, what was a separator for those guys besides talent? Well, I think some struggle with uh, the going into the – I mean, Brandon, Tim, Ryan went to ASU, so he went to college first, but the other two were first-round draft picks. They went into it. I think the struggle is like any struggle. It's like a whole different culture, and it's you're trying to make it yourself, and then you're with a whole bunch of different people, and then you know you're with a bunch of guys, and all of a sudden failure becomes real. And it wasn't as real when you're in high school. You're just dominating, and then all of a sudden you have some failure, and sometimes it's hard to handle unless you have somebody along with you that can mentor you a little bit, which is usually an older person that's been through it. So I think they struggle that way on the mental part of it. I mean, I think a lot of guys do when they – they get to a level when they're first round draft picks, their expectations overwhelm them. So and they were good enough. I think some of the stuff that happened to them was just unfortunate. But I mean, they, uh, Brandon played in the major leagues for a while, but it was a tough road for him to hold because he really never got consistent playing time to prove himself. And that's similar to your, maybe your average high school kid that's coming from grade school to high school. How are you helping those guys make the transition from grade school to now coming to high school to play? What I did, I started clinics right away. I started camps right away. So I knew kids when they were eight years old. Some of them I knew, they were with me for all that time. So they knew the coach, they knew who I was, knew my coaching staff. And then we do a lot of clinics, a lot of managers clinics with people around the community in our high school. So that was really, I mean, it's a lot of work, but the tough part about that is you have an eight-year-old that wants to be in your program. He comes every year, he's a great kid, and he isn't able to make your team. That is a tough conversation sitting with a kid. Because you want to keep them all because they're such great kids. But they knew what they were getting into. And some of them maybe didn't like the coach because we were pretty demanding as far as discipline and, and character and, and doing it the right way. And some kids struggle with that, to be honest with you, even at a younger age. <laughs> Hell accountable. So, But, I mean, that helped us because I knew, I knew every kid almost that came in our program. I think that's a common theme for a lot of the better high school programs out there is they have feeder programs with mm -hmm. their youth leagues. I think it's necessary. It's necessary to involve the parents, even at that age. I mean, when they come and the kids waking up and they're having fun playing, that's, a, that's, and just keep them going. You know, you don't have to be a great coach fundamentally, but if you keep the spark and the, the love of the game going, I think that's a very successful youth coach, not about the wins and losses and the tournaments and all that stuff. How long did it take you guys to win your first state championship? Ooh, we started with 82, 13 years. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that, that's a good example showing of, of how long it does actually take to build something. Oh, it does. I mean, like out here, it just, it took some time. You know what I mean? We were, we went to the semifinals and uh, the quarters before that, but we never really went to the finals. First time we went to the finals in 95, we won it, but you got to be patient. I mean, I mean, that's an end goal, but it's just the process of getting there. This, the journey was more fun for me than actually the game. And then I, You'll laugh at this. I feel embarrassed saying this, but I didn't enjoy it as much as I should have because I because we had a lot of kids come back. And then one of my players says, repeat. Then he got I'm walking up the stairs of the stadium. I'm going, man, I was just about ready to enjoy this. And now he's got me thinking about next year already. <laughs> I'm going, can you just relax and enjoy it? And I, I didn't enjoy it as much as I should have. That's true. <laughs> How did that team do the next year? We won it. So I threw it out there. He was right. He's a funny <laughs> kid. He went to Miami and played. He was a catch for us. He was hilarious. And that's I mean, the I, unique I'll, I'll thing with that. high school, too, is it's in cycles. You can't really recruit. I mean, I know some of the private schools can, but you can't really recruit. So you're kind of beholden to who shows up on campus. But it, it seems like you get in those cycles where – you have kids that may be in their peer group or class behind them had played together growing up and they're good. And it just seemed like they all kind of arrive at the same time. That's true. And I love just playing with the boys in the hood, you know, cause I, you know, like I had those kids and I mean, I would be ashamed of myself if I recruited because I had those kids in camp for all those years, they're coming up to play and like, 
people wanted to come in, I think I decruited more than anything. I'm going, I'm just, I'm just happy with the kids that are in my neighborhood. And you can come here, but there's no guarantees. They always wanted guarantees too. It was hilarious. Some of the conversations were funny. Yeah, as a coach, what do you feel like helped your players the most? Um, I think the honesty and straightforwardness of who we are, the process, what we're trying to do. Uh, relationships were really important to me. And um, I think I modeled that pretty well. Like having, I, I wish as a younger coach, I would have been more relational, but a younger coach, you're a little bit more different. You're into the winning and establishing yourself and all that kind of stuff. But I think um, developing personal relationships with your kids and having them own their own, you know, own what they do on the field. Cause I always said, practices are for me, the games were you guys. I mean, you got to go on play. I'm not going to coach that much. I'm going to strategize, but for the most part, I'm going to let you go. Cause if I did my job, I should send the bleachers and watch you play. And so I think we established a lot of kids are really close to this date. I mean, that's what makes me feel good. They'll come back. They have their kids, but I mean, a lot of kids really develop some great relationships. Kids didn't even know all of a sudden they're fast friends forever. You know, I mean, they're friends for life. So I think that's the, I know we get into the, the, the X's and O's and all the fundamentals and the hitting stuff and the pitching stuff. But if you don't have a positive culture, it, it's going to backfire on you. It's just not much. It's not fun. You can win a state championship and it can be not fun in my opinion. I mean, when you say positive culture, what are some examples of, of positive culture? <clears throat> having fun at practice and having competition at practice and, um, trying to get 1% better, um, being accountable with each other, being able to joke with each other. I mean, one of the funniest things I took as a compliment years ago is some of the kids came up after a game and we were joking. And I mean, our coach were joking with each other and we're pretty loose in the dugout. We are telling us, don't take this wrong, but you're a bunch of old guys having a lot of fun in the dugout. I goes, we kind of like that. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I mean, they're, they're going to put enough pressure on themselves with, you know, everybody's result oriented except on the field. I mean, we're more processed. Right? Everybody's telling them, did you win? How many hits you get? All that kind of stuff. So I think they enjoyed the experience of practice and we did some crazy stuff in practice for competition. And I think they always enjoyed that. I really do. So if you got to make it fun, but I, I held them accountable though. I'm boasting that I wasn't strict as I was, especially on behavior. I mean, what, what are some of those competitive things you would do with them that maybe you think is, is crazy or, or I, I don't think they, in my view, it's probably not crazy to me because I've had some crazy stuff happen, but I mean, what, what well, kind of crazy of them, stuff? I'd take a PO or somebody could not hit at all. Okay. I'd choose him right after the season start. I go, he's my pizza guy. I'll let him hit in practice. If he ever hits it out, I'll buy y'all pizza. I was pretty, pretty good about, you know, then on a couple of windy days, I had a kid, you know, they come up and they hit and the place would go nuts. I mean, they would dogpile on this guy. And I always lost pizza every year, but the pizza guy was a really fun event for us. And then um, just at the end of practice, sometimes we do the opposite, opposite field hitting or opposite, opposite way hitting and we choose teams. And heck, I found some kids hit better left than they did right and they started hit left. We did throwing stuff. We just all kinds of stupid competition. Like, run to third base instead of first base and, you know, just reverse the whole field and just stuff like that, just to loosen them up. Cause the more tense, I think the game is sometimes you're playing a big, I, I'll give you an example before state championship, the Friday night before state championship Saturday, our practice was hilarious and we had so much fun. It was like one of those loose practices where we're just getting a mindset. Hey, we belong here. This is our tournament to win, but, and we didn't want to get by hurt, but we had, our, my assistant coach was hilarious. He, come up with all kinds of stuff. So we're pretty loose that way. So stuff like that. Then they come back and they talk about that sometimes. Not when it says, you remember when you did this? Remember when you did that? That was so fun. And so I think you got to do those things too. Did pizza guy ever work his way into the lineup? Um, as a pitcher. Yeah. As a hitter. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, oh no, that's a good story. One of the pizza guys was, uh, <clears throat> he batted a thousand in his career at Horizon. The left-handed guy, the senior year wasn't what it was going to be, but so we were nine and nothing on this team, and you could ten run rule him. So I put him up to plate. It was in the sixth inning. I'm going, okay. I mean, it's his first at bat of the year, and it's late in the year. Kids are going crazy. What's he do? He hits a home run. He does a walk-off home run. He never bats again. I mean, that was one of the best moments ever. I mean, the kids are a great kid. It always remind me I should have hit more coach. Of I course. Told you to get out, but he hits it out. He's the pizza guy. 
in a game. So you can tell I, I paid for that one. <laughs> you know, you had a lot of players go to the next level. How do you balance maybe what's best for the individual player, what's best for the program? Just being perfectly honest with them. You know, like I would sit down with them, like, you know, the recruiting is kind of wild the way it is, but do you want to play? And I would ask them questions. I mean, be honest with me, is academics more important than baseball? Is baseball more important than academics? And, you know, some kids feel baseball is pretty important to me. And I go, well, do you want to play right away? Or do you want to go to a place where you can maybe not play, but it's a bigger school and all those things. And, you know, like I would ask them all those questions and their parents I'd bring in too. I'd help them that because that's, I mean, they, everybody thinks they're a D1 athlete and they're not, but once they found out that D3 schools play really well and they have a great experience, student teacher ratio is great. They go and they play all the time and they realize that baseball is part of life, but it's not life. And they have such a great experience doing that and meeting people on a, a smaller scale. But I was just honest with them. I go, here's why I think you can play, but what, and I'd always ask, what do you think? What, what, what do you want out of this? And, um, I'd tell them how to email coaches and, and what to say. And uh, I'd let the parents in on this because I think it's important that they know. But I mean, sometimes the parents didn't like my honesty, you know, because the kid they thought was a lot better is draftable and they're not. And the kid's great and the kids, kids know and they're okay with it. And so what happens is some of the kids that play D3 or D2 or NAI and the lower level will come back and talk to these kids. Hey, let me tell you something. Go if you want to play. This is a great experience for me. I, I wanted to play at D one, but you know what? I this is the best experience of my life. I got to play. I got to meet a lot of good people. So honesty was always important. I was and they would ask, I would ask them. You know, what do you think? What do you want out of this? And if you go to a university and it basically doesn't work out, would you stay there? Because you're choosing because of a lot of different reasons. A lot of Arizona kids do not want to go to cold weather, though. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> spoiled <laughs> it's usually the reverse you get all these upper midwest kids going down there for junior mm -hmm. college and then they they may bounce back uh yeah that's options. true yeah our junior college system is really great out here too. it's, it's awesome really good. it's awesome yeah, it really it's is. tremendous yeah you have extensive background in pitching i mean how did you balance that with your head coaching duties and uh, were you the pitching coach also or did you hand that over to somebody else i was because no one wanted it yeah <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to work for Luke. If you were, That's coaching, work. isn't it? It I mean, is. It's like, okay, nobody wants to do this. I guess I got to take it over. Animal, so they're like, you need, need sports psychology degree. But <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I love them. But um, I, I did it all the time. And as well as I always delegated my, like had a catching guy and hitting pretty much. We wanted kids to have their head coach was their position coach. That's why I told him to go, if you're – if the infield coach comes to me and he says, I think you should start 99.9% .9 of the time, I'll listen to him. So don't think I'm just the head coach. He's the head coach of what he's doing. And I delegated great coaches. So I was able to do that, but they understood how much, how important their, their position coaches were. So, I mean, and you have to have the same terminology. You can't have like hitting can get crazy in a high school situation for four coaches talking about four different things to a hitter. And I didn't want that to happen. So, we, we did a pretty good job of that, but pitching was, you know, I, I, I went to a lot of clinics. I listened to a lot of people that I think are really important that, that really spend their life on pitching. I listened to those guys because they're spending their life on how to pitch and how to take care of them pitchers. And I was really strict about pitching too much or, and um, I was, I know I pitched from the stretch early on because I thought they needed, it was easier mechanically. So when they were freshmen, I know I took a lot of heat for this. I mean, throw fastballs and change-ups. We experimented with curveballs, but that was our main two pitches. Locate them, get your mechanics great, and pitch. And pitch from the stretch the whole time. And then when you want to wind up and you're solid, then we did. So I took some heat for that, but kids were great about it. You know, I know they wanted to throw breaking pitches, but they realized that change-up was a pretty good pitch, and a located fastball was pretty hard to hit, especially in high school. So, I mean, I, I listened to a lot of people, I mean, from the sports medicine standpoint. So... We've never had Tommy John. I never helped pitch kids at all. I mean, I thought it was important that they understood the buildup of it and how important it was to take care of their arms. And I'm really anal about a throwing program. I mean, I'm always out there with them when they're warming up. I mean, they hated it. I'm out there. You know, I'm just on them all the time about throwing. But we didn't have injuries. I mean, we did. We did. Alan Jagger came to our field a few times, and he was. That's a good presentation to have. And 
watch what we did. And so he was, it's really beneficial having him there sometimes too. So you stayed with the, the Jager long toss. We did, but I mean, I, I think every kid's different, but I, I like, I like the longevity of throwing a little longer and getting loose. I mean, our typical practice was we would do a dynamic stretch for eight minutes. We go do J bands. By that time we're 15 minutes in with sweat and we're loose and we threw. And then we had the program where we threw some kids. I said, it's up to you how long you go. It depends how you feel. You listen to your arm. And we talked about what does it mean to listen to your arm? Cause you gotta educate them because kids are just going to throw. They're not going to talk to you. I was the same way. My arm hurt. Oh no, it's great coach. You know, so you got to watch their mechanics of velocity and the elbow drops or something's wrong. And so you bring them aside because they don't want to compete, but we had a really good, we had a really good um, run of no arm problems though. Because I, mean, I emphasize it. Because some things have evolved about pitching and, and there's some tried and true things that have happened forever with a warm up and making sure you're getting the body going before you start playing catch that's been around forever from a longevity yeah. standpoint, but oh, what yeah. do you, what do you feel like has evolved on the pitching side from when you first started? You mean got better or worse? Uh, e both. <laughs> you know, I've thought about this a lot. I've talked to Alan about it a lot. You know, I think one thing that I don't know, even know how you do this with youth, with club ball, you have a practice a week or maybe two practices and you play games. Well, you're not throwing the rest of the time. Yep. And that's a problem. I think the more you throw, I get to high school, a lot of times your arm problems go away because you're throwing every day. Yep. You have a system where you're throwing. So I don't know how to stop that. But Take a bucket of balls and go to a field somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I think if you throw more at that younger age, I, I don't think your arm problems happen that way because you're asking kids to throw. I mean, it's a crazy, you know this. We're working with you. I know the answer to it, but it's crazy to play five, three games in a day. You know, I mean, I think that's insane. And I, I just, I mean, first of all, kids pitching. And then he might catch the next day or, you know, I mean, then he's playing another position. He's, he's nine years old or 10 years old. And he's out there, he plays five games in a weekend. We wouldn't ask a grown man to do that. So I think there's, that's, I think that's where they get hurt a little bit because the fatigue of it and they don't throw mechanically very well. Sometimes they're trying to flip curveballs with their arm all over the place. And so, I mean, that's a tough, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I wish I did, but I think if they threw more, Yes, I think we not off the more. mound, but uh, you know, flat yeah. ground and and just yeah. play catch and just, keep the arm moving. Catch. Yes, and That's condition the arm. Younger. We play catch a lot. Yes, condition the arm. Yeah, condition. I agree. So I mean, it's a. I think. I'm not sure of this, but I think if you look at kids that throw really hard early, like at 15, you're throwing 95. I think if you follow those kids, they get 90 when they're in high school, maybe 100. I don't know if they're ready to do that. I mean, structurally, I, I, I don't know how many of those kids get hurt or have Tommy John because you're asking your arm to explode. I mean, at a great rate and you're not even a grown man yet. I don't know. I mean, I know it's everybody loves the great art gun and we're in love with it and we love the kid throws hard, but I'm in love with the kid can pitch and stay healthy and stay healthy. For you sure. Know, I mean, sometimes it, even if I had a kid through 95, which I never did, but if I did, I think I would tone him down a little bit. And then just work on how to pitch and then not try to overthrow it, not throw 95 all the time, you know, not to try to hump it up because he's at the radar gun behind. And, and we're part of that. I mean, scouts go on the radar gun. The kids are told some D1 programs, oh, if you don't throw 90, you can't play here. I've seen some great pitches at, in D1 levels that just screw people up that aren't throwing 90. They know how to pitch. Well, how easy can you throw hard? I love that term. Like, how <laughs> easy can term. you throw hard? And, yeah. you know, that's a sequencing thing. The body's working together better. The arm's staying loose. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, it's more on the lower half than it is on the arm. I just, it you is. know, we've gotten to that point now where, you know, that that is going to be a kid's first reaction once the radar gums cub comes out is yeah. they want to tighten up to see how hard they can throw. And it's, it's well, the then exact they go to a showcase and, and their arm's not loose. They go to a showcase in the off season. They try to burn the radar gun and they can blow their arm out. I mean, it's, that's a vicious cycle, but. I think there's better pitching now, though. I mean, I see kids that can really pitch at a younger level. I mean, really pitch, and, and they command it. I mean, they actually have good command. Even at the major leagues, you watch those guys that walk people. A lot of times, that that's the deciding factor in winning an MLB playoff game. You walk guys, and they score early because they? they're certainly not hitting them <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you, you've seen it already in these playoffs. The big innings yeah. have been a, a walk or an air and then a, mm -hmm. a home run. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
you know, even at that level. Yeah. How's so the Arizona, the biggest... how's the Arizona school of baseball been for you? It's, it's just, I mean, it's nothing big. It's just a couple of teams we had and I coached my grandson's team. Now he's a freshman in high school at Horizon. So I don't coach him anymore, but I coached that for three years, which was great because we practiced more than we played, learned a lot. By the end, I was practicing just like a varsity team and they loved it because it was really fast paced and it was less than two hours and we were going. So they liked that part of it and all the stuff we do is stupid stuff we did with high school kids. We did with them and they liked the competition too, but then we have another team that's 12 year right now, but I'm nothing big. I mean, it's nothing big at all. I mean, I, I want to keep it that way. So I don't, I don't want to be one of those people that has 20 teams. I mean, I want to control, I'm a control freak, I guess. I just want to control the product out there. So, I mean, a former player of mine coaches the other team, the 12 u team and all my coaches that I've had with me have been my former players. And what's great about that is when I get on these kids, they're, they're happens to listen to them more than me, which I'm totally cool with, you know, cause, and they're, and they love them. I mean, these kids do such a good job with the kids, but they, you know, they've had some success on another level. And so they listen to those kids. And that's yeah. part of setting them up for success. Correct. Like you're, you're doing it like the high school cause they are going to go play high school baseball at some point. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're a little bit more acclimated to the high school schedule that way. They are, they're more acclimated to a practice like that. What's expected of them. And, you know, just learning the game and, and not worrying about anything else and having fun learning the game. And I think they did. I mean, those kids, young kids are so hard on themselves. That's what I found out. It's like, my, my gosh, geez, come here. This is not life or death here. <laughs> Let's have more fun. I mean, you're, you're going to fail. I, I, I would tell me, you know, some guys that are great hitters in the major leagues go 0 for 4. They strike out four times the next game. They hit three home runs. You think they're worried about it? Do you think that they don't think they're a good hitter after 0 for 4? They do. They just go to the next day. When you learn that, you're going to be really good. And so we've really progressed. I think I progressed more mentally with those kids from 12, 13, 14 than I did physically. I mean, because I, I see them out there and they handle failure so much better now because it's okay, because it's going to happen. It's like you can really use that as a teaching, as you well know. Yeah. Are you spending some time on breathing routines with those young guys? We do. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Best place to start. It is. No doubt. Best Anybody can use it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Even at younger ages, younger than you think. They even need it more because they're going to get wound yeah. up at times way more. <laughs> You're seeing oh, yeah. a kid I mean, throw hard for the first time, you know, yeah. balls coming off the bat harder. You know, it's just, yep. they need it more than the older guys sometimes. Oh yeah. Yeah, they do. You're right. How'd you get involved with USA baseball? Um, George Sanchez asked me to coach with him in 2009. I just retired as a teacher. Um, and um, I thought about doing it before, but I was so busy with camps and clinics with my guys. So he asked me to be on staff. I felt bad about it because I know you got to really work yourself up into that. But he wanted me to be assist on the 2009-16 U team. So I did that, and it was a tremendous experience. I mean, it was it's just not, I can't tell you what that experience was. It was awesome. And the next year, um, they asked me to be the manager of the 2010-16 U team, which was the Pan Am Games in Mexico. And then, then – then they asked me to do design and facilitate the development program there when they started the development program. So I did that and continued to do that until they hired somebody that does that now. But that's how I got involved. I mean, I really appreciate their trust in me and, and the opportunities they gave me. And in 2015, I helped coach the 18U team in Japan, which is, that was an unbelievable game. I mean, that was an unbelievable time there. I mean, playing Japan in Japan for the gold medal was what a game. That was fun. But I mean, it was, I like what they do. I mean, they stand for, it's like how they discipline, how they run things. They're so organized and working with the people there were great. So, I mean, it was just, it's just a whole different experience and working with the kids. I mean, I mean, look, how good a coach can you be? I had in my 2010 team, I had Matt Olson at first, Alex Bregman at second, Corey Seager at short. I mean, and they're all like major league players. I mean, and mentally they were right, they were right there. I mean, they're incredible. I mean, I mean, I better win. <laughs> I mean those guys but look what those guys have done holy cow I think about that I go those guys were in our infield at one time and you and put the were, high I, school manual together for USA Baseball correct I did yeah I mean where'd you start with that and when when you're Ooh. gonna have a blank slate manual where's the first place you yeah. start I just started writing stuff down what what I did is I based on what I would want to know as a high school coach, everything from start to finish, like parents, school, 
on the mental aspect of balancing your family with it. So I, I start with that general scope of, okay, if I was a young coach, <clears throat> what would I like to look at in a male, just not X and O, so the whole thing. So it took me a while. I mean, uh, my daughter's a writer and I really respect writers because some days you would sit there and you just blank out and the other days you go four hours just crazy. And then you go blank again. I'm going, I really, so it's 80 some pages, which I've never read anything like that. And I know some of the sports medicine stuff was somebody else, but for pretty much it was what I, I got and I mulled over it a lot. And so when I was finished, I'm pretty proud of it. Cause I think I had enough experience to write it, knowing what happens from start to finish as a young coach moving up and what would be valuable. And, and so it was, it was, it was fun to write, but it was, it was, it was challenging. I mean, it really was, but I really appreciate them allowing me to do it. And, and then they took some of that stuff for the youth, the 14 under one or the new, new one that they did. Yeah. So, those was, elite yeah. writers, they tell you, just, you have to sit down like, and, and just start writing. Like just every, that's part of their routine that the high end writers, they sit down at the same time every day and they just start writing. And yeah. then they'll get some decent stuff out of it. And some days they, they'll get great stuff. Some days they won't, but it's just the, the, the habit and routine of writing every day. I so respect them now. I'm going, Oh my gosh, how the frustration of it go, but this is horrible. Who would want to read this? <laughs> That's what editors oh are for. <laughs> <laughs> what have you enjoyed about the ABCA youth committee? I, I just think that's where it is. Yeah. I think that's the, the, the heart and soul of the sport. Yes. I just do. I mean, I think my freshman coach in high school is the heart and soul. I mean, you got to have a good freshman coach. I mean, that's where it all begins. But I think the youth thing is just a passion because I had such a great experience when I was a youth. I grew up in a farming community. My dad coached me. And it was the first team we ever had. We had we were in blue jeans and a T-shirt and a hat and went and played all these super-duper schools and, and places. And we ended up pretty good beating a lot of them. So, I mean, it was like, it meant so much to our community as young kids. We just came together and worked on the field, played on the field. And it just meant it was life changing for all our kids i mean so i think that's i just even even today someone will say you remember when we did this it was so awesome I, I just forget the times we had as as kids with no parents just go play make up our own games at the field and um i think the youth committee is the heart and soul of it it's difficult because there's it's complicated there's so many um tentacles out there of how people think it should be done and you have a lot of parents and factors and coaches and programs that it, they need to make money because that's their livelihood i get it but it's but it's still the grassroots of did the kid enjoy playing the sport and what do you get from it you know i mean that's if we can keep them going keep them playing keep them having fun i think that's that's the basis of it all and it's hard you know you're right in the middle of it right but you guys are doing a great it. job i mean it's come a long Trying. way i mean Trying. the education come a long way there's no excuse for anybody not to be educated on it none would you yeah. like to see multi-sport athletes come back? Absolutely. I mean, me too. Oh, gosh. Yes. Yeah. I was just reading Eric Cressy's thing about multi-sport athletes. He was talking about what the difference in kids nowadays. They don't play. They don't went out. When we went out, we just played. We played everything, and we probably didn't get injured at all. And, and there was not this pressure of, oh, I'm a one-sport athlete. Even if you do martial arts or something else, do something different. But you know, I mean, how do you? Think? I get bored doing one thing right now as an adult. I mean, I, me too. I, I get bored with it. Just so I mean, how do you how now. do you present that? How do you think you can get that accomplished in the youth? I mean, because club baseball sometimes is year round. It drives me crazy. So, and then there's the pressure of the kid. I feel sorry for the kid. Well, if I don't play here, and I got to play here, and I got to play there, and then they're playing two sports at one time, which is not good. I'm paying for playing for two clubs at one time. I don't know. What do you? Uh, I. I I don't know if you put the toothpaste back in, but again, there was designated seasons for sports. Yes. I mean, it really, you, you flowed with the different seasons. And so you knew when it was fall, it was probably yeah. football or basketball <laughs> or football yeah. or soccer. Winter time was going to be basketball. Spring was, was flowing into baseball. I also played tennis growing up too. So it yeah, was like, too. there was a lot of stuff going on, but you just knew that, okay, when, when that competitive season mm -hmm. ended, it was time to go get ready for the for the next one. Um, but you know, I, it's hard to you promote see, you that. You see both I mean, sides of it. I mean, you. you, you I do. Can... I mean, I think when they get older, they're looking yes. okay. If you're in a big school, it's, it's a big time program. You're going. 
if I play basketball and football and baseball, and baseball is a sport I think I'm better at, I might lose it. I might get behind. And, you know, I mean, they they have that fear of like, well, if I don't play the coach, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I understand where they're coming from at that level. And sometimes by their junior year, maybe they do want to specialize and get better. I mean, I see that, but when you're in a small school, you got to play them off, right? And you're yes, allowed you to play to. them off because you have to. Bigger schools, you're looking at their baseball, their football program, their basketball program, and go, man, if I don't emphasize, I probably won't play. I get that. I do. That's a tough one. I love multi-sport athletes. Most major leaguers are. A lot of them. A lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah, a lot of them are. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, somebody will come at you and be like, well, they're, they're really athletic, which they are. They are. <laughs> But, yeah. you know, you have some outliers, too, that, that that make it, and maybe that's the one sport. So, I mean, there's there's so many different, you said tentacles, there's so many different tentacles to that that, you know, there, it's all gray area. Um, but but really, that the health piece, I don't think you can deny that trying to, to re- demarcate those seasons to where you are mm-hmm. shutting that sport down for a little bit, yeah. you can't deny that that's going to be healthier yeah. for somebody. And I think it's just not physical health. I think a lot of it's mental health. I mean, I really do. I mean, allow the kid to be a kid, but it's, there's pressure on them, you know, that they, I got to do this or I'm not going to be here. I mean, I once did a clinic. You'll laugh at this. I once did a clinic. This guy was coaching eight-year-olds, and I told him about just learn how to throw. Don't throw curveballs. Just learn how to throw. And he, he walked out. He yelled at me. He goes, I can't believe what you just said to me. If I don't develop the eight-year-old in the curve, throwing a curveball, I'm just destroying his major league career. <laughs> Honestly, God. So he walked out of the clinic and I'm going, okay. I mean, that's just, to me, that's scary, bizarre. It is. Well, it's lack of education. <laughs> it's just crazy, but I don't know. I mean, I know, I think you're doing, I know you're doing the right things. And I think you're presenting it the right way and education the right way. It's just that people make choices. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I think you need to ask your kid without the pressure of, hey, because I remember my daughter, I'll tell you this, she was a really good softball player at 12. She, I'll never forget this conversation. We're driving her home from a tournament game. She was a good hitter. She was a good player. And she goes, Dad, I got to ask you something. Would you mind if I don't play softball next year? I go, no, just tell me why. I, and that's fine with me. She goes, well, take today. I played center field. I got on base twice. I stole once. I backed up everything, didn't get a ball. It's not enough for me. Not enough action. Beautiful. Is that the right reason or what? <laughs> yeah, for her, for sure. Definitely. I mean, so, I mean, I, and, you know, she thought, because I was a baseball coach, I said, you do what you want to do and play. And she played them all in high school. So, I mean, it was fun. But, I mean, like, I thought it was great to let them, let them have the avenue to talk. like Because I think they're afraid to disappoint their parents. Like, hey. Definitely. It's okay if I just go play something else for a while. I don't know. I think in the off season, like for little league kids, just give them a YMCA basketball league with each other and play. Have in a rec league and play basketball if you want to do something different together because you still take your team together and do something else. Do an indoor soccer or something. I don't know. Do something. So, do you, do you have a fail forward moment? Do you have something you thought was going to sidetrack you, but looking back now was one of the best things that happened to you? Ooh, well, when I was a younger coach, I can tell you this, and this is a younger coach can listen to this. I was pretty intense in my first job in Ohio. It's head coach right out of high school, right out of college. And there's this one time that I really humiliated a kid on the field. He made an error and he was kind of loafing around in practice. And I just lit him up. I mean, lit him up in the game on the field. And then he came in, I lit him up. And then I realized that I destroyed him. I humiliated him. And so <clears throat> after the game, I realized what I had done. And I, and I, it was a deciding moment for, I got the team together, go, look, your head coach made a big mistake today. I go, I took something really personal. I said, I don't want that to ever happen again. I want to apologize to this kid and I want to apologize to you as your coach. I go, that's something that should never happen. If it happens again, I'm going to fire myself. I said, that just shouldn't happen. That was a deciding moment for me because I realized I just almost destroyed a kid out there and it really broke me up. I mean, I'm going, what did I just do? Because that's my own ego. So as a younger coach, you get into that habit, but as an older coach, saying moments, oh, wow. I was going to resign one time because I just, wasn't allowed to do what I wanted to do at Horizon. And they just stymied me like in 1991. I said, I I can't do what I want to do for this community and this youth. And I can't do this program because you don't let me do it. I said, I'm not costing you money, just let me do it. 
And so a new principal came in and he said, down, he goes, I'm not going to take this from you. And I go, tell me what you want. So he was great. Said, not going to cost you money, just going to give me, give me the opportunity. I said, you'll be, you'll be surprised how the committee comes here. We'll build our facility. And that's when it happened. I was designing because I was going to go and go somewhere else and coach. I go, I just can't do it anymore. You just put the brakes on me. And so those two moments were pretty, I was trying to think about it. Wow, if that happened. And then now that what happened between then and then is, is pretty amazing. So I'm glad I'm glad he talked me out of it because he had my resignation for all summer. And then I just thought about it and he came back and he says, let's go, let's do this. So that was a deciding moment. I think every coach might go through it. You never want, I never, you never want to think about resigning right after your season because you're so tired emotionally. You need to let it ride. Yeah. <laughs> You do, and you need to ask people. That pause, about it. you need that. That's part of decision oh, making is pause before you, you have really any do. sort of gut reaction. Because you might make the wrong decision. I almost did. Yeah. And also taking ownership. I mean, with your player situation, well, we're always going to make mistakes. And I think part of it is you have to take ownership of it and oh, you do. And, and throw it out there. Because um, cause that could have got sideways on you in a hurry with that player. And I, you know, when I evaluate myself, I, I don't talk much after a game, maybe a minute just to get things together. And then we go to practice the next day because kids don't want to hear it. They're hungry. They want to get down of there. So I, I remember like I'd go to the next practice or if I did something really bad, I'd say it right after the game. But I always want them leaving positive, leaving, hey, we'll, we'll take care of this tomorrow. Let's go. Because they don't want to hear it. They knew whether they played well or not. But um, I would always I would always open up to them and go, you know what? I'm going to tell you this. When I sent that guy from third, bad mistake. See, coaches make mistakes too. So I'm trying to get better too. So you have to understand, I go to clinics. I, I'm trying to get better coaching you guys. So we're all in the same boat. You get it? So we just accountable to each other. And we, you can have accountability buddies. One time, one of the players wanted me to be his accountability buddy instead of another player. So we did the whole year. So Really? Was how was that? That was great. It's great. That's I'm awesome. He trusted you enough to be his accountability partner. It was awesome. It's awesome. I, I, was, I was flattered. So instead of another coach meeting, he was my accountability partner. And so the other kids chose a kid on the team and it works out really well. I mean, they're friends, but then they're able to, it gives them a, I guess a highway to, Hey, I love you, but you know, don't do that again. You know, we're better than this and we're in this together. So, I mean, it really helped out, but for him to choose me was, and it was fun. I mean, he was saying, Hey coach, this is what our perception was, what you did. I go, it's good to know. Thank you. I didn't take offense to it. it Maybe a better coach. And that's part like of a that. that's part of positive culture too, correct? Is when the players oh. can start to police each other. Absolutely, and it's hard for them because they, you know it's really hard for them because they're just under such pressure. Social media. Well, I don't want him to be my friend. I want him to be my, if a good friend's going to make you accountable, buddy, you'll find that out. But I mean, allow them to do it. I, I gave them an avenue where they could do it. But it was great. I mean, I, I really actually really enjoyed because he gave me a different perspective than other coach would. You're in good shape still. Do you have any evening or morning routines that you go through? Because, I mean, you're in good shape. You're good shape physically. You're cognitively in great shape. Do you have any hacks uh, that you like? Keep moving. <laughs> when you keep say keep moving, like, what, what is that for you? Like, movement. Stretching, walking. Got dogs walking. I got two hunting dogs. They want to get out all the time. Walking. My wife and I walk together. She does a lot of yoga and stuff. So, I try to do yoga. But she's a lot better at it than me. <laughs> I do a lot of stretching, still work out, still, uh, I do some lessons sometimes with the kids and, um, I work out with my grandson a lot because he wants me to throw a lot of BP to him and all that stuff. So he keeps me active too. So, but you know, just keep things per power perspective and just go day by day, try to eat well and get some sleep and not take things so serious. <laughs> Where is there to hunt in Arizona? Uh, up North. How far oh, up you north? You can have dove and dove. birds just to just north of where I live, but you can up, up north. There's all kinds of hunting, but but yeah, you can you have to you have to draw for things for elk and deer and stuff like that. You have to draw to get lucky to go, and they have seasons, so that's kind of cool. They have a lot of elk in northeastern Arizona. I mean, if you drive at night, you might run into one. You don't want to run into an elk. Yeah, people sometimes don't even drive at night in certain areas because the elk. Are, I mean, they're all over the place. It's unbelievable. You'll see hers of 30. It's incredible. Yeah. When was your first convention? 1972. It's not the ABC. It was some sort of convention in Chicago. And I didn't know how to teach catching. And Dwayne Banks was the catching guy from Iowa. Yeah. 
That's when I saw Gordy Gillespie. I'm going, I'm, I don't have any idea how to catch. And so I drove up to Chicago from Van Wert on a snowy day for the weekend. And that's when Gordy Gillespie was the opening guy. I'm going, oh my gosh. I, I was out of my seat. It just got better. And then Dwayne Banks pretty much took everything he had about catching. So that was my first one. And then they started going to him after that sporadically. Um, then when I got out here, I went to him a lot. When I got to Arizona. Do you have your Hall of Fame speech ready? I've thought about it. I've got it kind of structured out, but I'm at three to five minutes. You know, I mean, it's a sprint. I'm trying to keep, trying to keep it to three. It's a dead sprint. But I, I just want to honor the people that it's such a wee award for me. I mean, I just want to honor the people as, as much as I can in that three minutes that, that because it's part, it's really part of their award. I mean, it really is. I mean, I'm trying to be overly humble, but it, I mean, I think all those guys think that way. Like, I never thought, I look at those guys up there and go, wow. Pretty I don't cool. think you get on that stage without being that way. Like, I, I really don't. With our organization and, and what our organization stands for, I don't think you get on that Hall of Fame stage if that's not the way that you handle things. I'm sure that's true. I mean, I'm, I am I mean, I got a lot from my dad. I mean, just his morals. And growing up in a farming community, I told my wife this the other day, I'm going to honor my community because teamwork was serious. I mean, farms and stuff. I mean, if you didn't have something, you never went without. People would pick you up. I grew up that way. So when I came out here to Scottsdale, Arizona, it was a little different. I'm going, wait a minute, we don't do it that way here. Well, we do now. <laughs> We're going to be a team. And so, I mean, I grew up I grew up so fortunate to understand what sharing and what love and what what relationships were that I didn't know any other way to do it. So I'm not all that. I just didn't know any. I didn't grow up that way. So I just continued. I think teamwork and loving your players and tough love and making sure everything's okay as much as you can balance your life out. So, I mean, that's, that's how I took into coaching. I mean, teaching, I mean, I love teaching kids. I loved high school kids. I think they're fantastic. When did you have to work on the farm? Growing up. I know, but at what, at what age did, did your dad put you to work? We put me to work in the factory at 14. And that was uh, what type a of factory? factory. It was a hide, hide factory where you got hides from the slaughterhouse. You grade them out, cut them up, and pound them out of smelly manure, all that kind of stuff. He wanted me to make sure I knew how to work. I was always painting, doing jobs. The only time I really had to go to the farm a lot, because the farm was by our house, but it was people that farmed it were other people. But I would go there, and I remember painting 25 buildings by a brush one summer. I'll never forget that. Buy it with a brush. Big barns, 25 buildings. You know what? And working in the hide house, that made you that made you understand what work ethic was every day. And then seven thirty to four thirty, and then I go play ball after that. And maybe that also figure out that coaching might be a little bit better than skin and hides, right? <laughs> yes. Going to college and getting a degree and coaching is gonna be a little bit better than this. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, Eric, what are some final thoughts? I'm just I'm I'm just honored to be on your program, first of all. And I really appreciate the youth. And I think that's the heart and soul of what we're trying to do. And people make choices, but I think I think it's come a long way. And I just think try to take a breath. And and uh, if you're going into coaching, I always ask myself this question: Is that would I want to be coached by me after after every practice? Would I want to have been coached by me today in this game or this practice? And and I would tell I would tell coaches they know there's two different coaches in the world. There's ones that are out for themselves and ones that are out for them. And the kids know it at every level. They'll talk about, I told them, I told Lily, Chris, they don't talk about whether you won the Lily championship. They talk about how fun you were. Do you understand when I talked to Lily? Do you understand that? They don't talk about winning a championship. They talk about how good you were, how much fun you were, and they want to play with you the next year. So I think that's the, everything will take care of itself when you do that. You know, I think you need to be organized. I think you need to get, if you're going to coach, you need to be committed to education and be a better coach. And it's always out. I mean, you guys have done a great job. It's out there more than ever. So there's no excuses there, but people are busy. But um, I do think it's more important than ever in this society to coach kids and gear them with social media, gear them the right direction because they're getting pulled from all different directions. I feel bad for them. I don't know how to grow up in this, or you probably either. So I think more than any time in our country, coaching is probably the mo one of the most important jobs you ever have because you're going to influence kids. And you'll never, you never know until they come back. And they, you know, that was a big influence on me is what you did that day, that day. I mean, some kids will tell me exactly what I said to them 20 years later, exact words. 
So you think about that. That's an impact, right? So that's what I leave coaches with. Don't underestimate your impact with these kids. What you say, and take like you said, take a breath. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time, Eric. I appreciate it. I always enjoy our interactions. I'm looking forward to seeing Nashville. Thank you very much. Really appreciate being on with you.